Right today I have a video for you called the American Revolution Oversimplified Part 1. Um, so let's just dive right in. Holy smokes! Christopher Columbus, that is no way to address the king and queen of Spain. What is wrong with you? Okay, okay, so you know how we're looking for a new trade route to India, right? Right. And the earth is round, right? Right. So I'm thinking we can just sail the other way around the planet, right? Yeah. So I set sail, right? Mm -hmm. And I reach India, right? Right. Wrong. Wrong. I did not reach India. I did not. All right. No. All right. Get to the point. Did you know? There's a whole nother freaking continent out there. Okay, and you think I should care about this? Why? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I forget to mention there's gold everywhere? Gold? Columbus landed in Central America in October 1492, and he had the time of his life. And by that I mean he went on a huge theft and murder spree. He stole gold, jewelry, people, and a hammock. And then he returned to show off all of his riches, including a few previously undiscovered items, such as tobacco, the pineapple, turkeys, and a hammock. Now I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified, Columbus didn't discover America, the Vikings did. And you'd be partially right. In the 11th century, Leif Erikson was the first European to land in America. But hey, if you love Vikings so much, then why don't you check out today's sponsor, Vikings War of Clans is a mobile oh, game wait, that was inspired by the famous strategy and RPG games of the 90s like Age of Empires and Civilization. Let's Do you like over the ad really quick here? Box below and get the special bonus of 200 But actually I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and take this opportunity that uh thing with Columbus is he did not actually think he dis found a new a new continent. He thought he was somewhere in Asia, maybe an undiscovered part of Asia, but he he truly thought that he was in Asia the entire time. Even when he got back with all the riches and everything that he had found, he believed that he got it from Asia. And when he described his journey and his journals and everything, um, there were others who were much more well educated than him who believe who pointed out that's not Asia. We know Asia pretty well. Uh, wherever you landed, it wasn't Asia. And so they started sending people back to the Americas to check it out and discover it. Actually, yeah, this is a new continent. This is a completely new land. We have no idea what this is. And, you know, they, they, they checked it out and they, they mapped it and the conquests and all that sort of thing started. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that Columbus did actually go back at one point with a group of basically just pillagers and pillaged what he could um, for Spain. Um, I believe it was Columbus who went back. I know that Spain sent a lot of people to the New World to just exploit it, uh, which they would do for a very long time and most of Europe would do for a while. But yeah, Columbus never realized he was in a, in a New World until much later on, I, I believe he was made aware after he got back and described his journey. And it's like, no, that's not Asia. That is not Asia. I don't know what you're talking about, but it's, it's not Asia. He went somewhere, but it wasn't Asia. Gold coins and a protective shield. Don't forget to look me up and join my Vikings clan under my nickname, Oversimplified. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Columbus, time of his life, hammock. And suddenly the race was on to explore and conquer the new world. After a couple centuries of warring with the natives and each other, the European powers had claimed quite a lot of land, including this area, which both the English and the French claimed as theirs. One day the French said, I'm gonna build some forts along here. And the English were like, could you not? And the French said, sorry, but no, I could not not. And they went ahead and built their forts, which pissed off the English. So they sent an up and coming British Lieutenant Colonel by the name of George Washington with a combined force of British troops and Native Americans. After a short battle, the French commander said, all right, all right, we surrender. Okay, boys, pack it up. They're surrendering. Oh, sorry, was I not meant to split his head open with a tomahawk? Ah, don't worry. It's not like this will start a seven-year-long major global conflict. And what happened next was a seven-year-long major global conflict, which Great Britain won. At the peace negotiations, Spain gave up Florida, while France gave up all of its territories in North America. But Britain's victory came at a cost, a 60 million pound cost. They were now broke, in a lot of debt, and had to come up with some way to repay it. So they went to the colonies and said, okay, listen up. So a huge part of the war was spent protecting you from the French, and now we have no money because of it. So... I'm not sure what you're saying here. Okay, so we spent a lot of money protecting you from the French, right? Right. And now we're broke. That certainly is a pickle. Listen to me. We spent all of our money protecting you, and now we need money. Can you please pay us back some money? No. 
Okay, we're just gonna go ahead and tax you. In 1764, Britain introduced the Sugar Act, forcing the colonists to import sugar and molasses exclusively from the British and to pay duties on them. Then a year later, they introduced the extremely controversial Stamp Act, and it worked a little something like this. Hello, shopkeep. Hello, Mr. Bungleberry. Here's the deed for your new shack. Stamp. That'll be three pence, please. Wait, what was that? It's the new tax. I get a stamp on any paper or documentation I make, and you have to pay for it. Would you like to see this pamphlet that explains everything? Yes, please. Okay. Stamp. Two pence, please. This is awful. You know what? Just give me a deck of cards so I can go gamble my pain away. Okay. No. <laughs> Don't do it. Stamp. Obviously, the colonists were like, Hey, my dudes, this new tax legislation right here, this is BS. Until now, they had enjoyed relative freedom to rule themselves, and now suddenly Britain was asserting its control. They were especially unhappy because they didn't have any representatives in the parliament that was levying taxes on them. So they protested, orators gave fiery speeches, British goods were boycotted, and anyone loyal to the British found themselves increasingly harassed. The whole thing actually began to take quite a toll on British business, and after just a couple years, the British were forced to repeal the Stamp Act. But we still desperately need money. What should we do? We could try taxing the colonies. Great idea. Yeah, so the Stamp Act was actually very, very unpopular. And it's really one of the things that, I don't want to say led to the revolution, but just created a lot of the, the dissent that would uh, fuel what was to come. Um, it was just such a over overreach by the British um, to tax people such in, so indiscriminately um, for very basic necessities and to force them to buy you know only British goods was what they felt to be infringement on not only their rights but sort of um, counter to why a lot of them went to the colonies in the first place a lot of them went there for reasons like freedom and for reasons like you know um, being in, being in a new world, being away from the old world and the old world was coming and sort of just forcing itself upon the colonists and they, they didn't like that. Um, but yet Stamp Act was wildly unpopular and it was so bad that the, the Americans were just, well the American colonists were just um, doing everything in their power to not allow the stamps they were they were doing any sort of trade or business they could that was exempt in order to prevent Britain from making any money off of it hoping that they would repeal it wait didn't we literally just try that and it failed miserably man look at me i look fabulous have you ever seen such a handsome boy no sorry georgie yeah, that's pretty no angry. way you're the handsomest smartest most popular king that ever lived and everybody likes you you're doing such a good job uh, your majesty? Oh, you're still here. Get the hell out. So in 1766, the British made a declaration saying, we can do what we want because we're in charge and you can all go suck it. Then they levied a whole bunch of new taxes on the Americans via import duties. Glass? There's a tax for that. Lead? There's a tax for that. Paper? Tea? Oil? There's a tax for that. And once again, the Americans boycotted British goods, British business felt the pinch, and the British had to back down. All right, this is ridiculous. They're my colonies and I have to be able to assert my control. Repeal all the new taxes except for the one on T. Also send 1,000 troops to Boston to take control. Oh, and make the colonists pay for them. And as British troops arrived, the tension in Boston was palpable. You could cut it with a knife, and it was all about to come to a head. On March 5th, a band of local patriots began heckling a British guard at the Customs House. More and more Americans joined in the heckling, while more British troops turned up in support of their comrade. Snowballs were thrown at the British. The snowballs turned to rocks, the rocks to oyster shells. The soldiers, outnumbered, panicked. One thing leads to another, and you can see where this is going. Five civilians were killed. The Patriot press throughout the colonies declared the Boston Massacre an unwarranted crime committed against the people of Boston by the cruel British, and the anger continued to grow. A British revenue schooner that ran aground in Rhode Island was burned by the locals. When it came to light that the governor of Massachusetts supported the suppression of the colonists, his house was burned by the locals. And next... Yeah, the Boston Massacre was pretty much the beginning of the end of uh, British rule in the 13 colonies after that point. You know, the rest of the colonies hadn't really come on board with the whole independence movement yet, but it was it was born out of New England, and th th this act of of blatant hostility, and and the, on top of all the taxation and repression, uh, really caused a lot of dissent within within the citizenry. Um, 
to a lot of the point where a lot of people weren't even really considering themselves British citizens anymore. They felt like they weren't being represented. They weren't being treated fairly. They were being repressed. They were being taxed. And now they were being violently uh, opposed when they protested. So a lot of them felt like they were not British citizens anymore. Um, even though they technically were, they felt like they weren't because the British would not treat their citizens this way. Um, so many differences had arisen between the two sides and uh, people really felt that they were much more autonomous and didn't need the British. Um, they felt that they could even move on and get goods from other countries should, should that be the case. And, and other, other colonies were definitely watching what was happening and not liking it, which helps when the revolution begins to get them on board. But um, it was really here in, in Boston, in Massachusetts, in New England, that things started and then it just spread throughout the colonies later. Because the, you remember the entirety of the colonies was affected by the Stamp Act and all these other acts. Um, but it, it was the massacre that really was the beginning of the end for the British. After that, they, they, any attempt to assert control again was opposed and just led to further escalation of the situation, uh, until everything finally came to a head. The colonists would set their sights on the remaining tax on tea. On December 16th, 1773, a band of patriots known as the Sons of Liberty disguised themselves as Native Americans, marched down to Boston Harbor, boarded a British merchant ship loaded with tea, and in front of thousands of spectators, threw nearly 10,000 pounds worth of tea overboard. The British were disgusted, and they punished Massachusetts with a vengeance. They dissolved its general assembly, revoked their charter, and sent 3,000 more troops to occupy the city, meaning Boston and Massachusetts were now essentially under the direct rule of Great Britain. And oh boy were the people pissed. The other colonies saw what was happening and worried they might be next. So they called a brain trust to decide what to do. 56 delegates from 12 colonies gathered and met in Philadelphia at the First Continental Congress. And the roll call read like a who's who of America's finest thinkers. I'm talking lawyers extraordinaire Johnny A and Johnny J, experienced military commander George Washington, businessman and future alcoholic beverage Samuel Adams, fiery orator Patty H. Guy who married a rich lady, Big J Dickinson, and while they weren't present at the first Congress, soon names like James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and much later Alexander Hamilton would all serve time in the Continental Congress. The question now though, was what to do about the British. After much bitter debate and disagreement, they eventually agreed on an amazing solution. They would simply ask the British to stop. Can you stop? No. It didn't work. Okay, then tell the local militias to start arming and be ready at a minute's notice. And across the colonies, these Minutemen stood ready for the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. Now having your colonies in open rebellion is one thing. Once they start arming themselves, that's when it really hits the fan. So British General Thomas Gage ordered 700 troops from Boston out into the rebel-controlled Massachusetts countryside to destroy stores of arms and ammunition held by the rebels in Concord. The British set out in the middle of the night. Patriots including Paul Revere wrote ahead to warn that the British were coming, giving the rebels time to prepare. The two sides met in Lexington as the sun began to rise. They faced off against each other, and in the confusion, somebody shot first. The shot heard around the world marked the beginning of the American War of Independence. The rebels were outnumbered and had to fall back to Concord as the British split up to search for rebel supplies. However, more and more Patriot rebels kept showing up, and this time it was the British who were outnumbered as more fighting kicked off in Concord. The most professional army in the world was forced to flee back to Boston at the hands of local, poorly trained militiamen. And all along the British route back to Boston, Patriot rebels continued to gather and open fire on the retreating British. When the British reached Boston, the rebel militias surrounded them. Boston and the British were now under siege as small land and naval skirmishes continued around the city and the British would suffer another embarrassing blow, this time in upstate New York. Colonel Benedict Arnold concocted a plan to take the British stronghold Fort Ticonderoga, which held a large amount of guns and ammunition. He set off towards the fort alone, hoping to recruit men along the way when he came across the Green Mountain Boys, led by Ethan Allen, who as it turned out, had the exact same plan he did. So they decided to work together, but I'm in charge. No, 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 I'm in charge. This went on for some time, until the Green Mountain Boys threatened to go home, and Arnold had to concede. The group raided the fort at night while the Redcoats were asleep, and they caught them completely by surprise, taking the fort and all of its munitions with almost no resistance. Wow, great job, Ethan. Very impressive. 
By the way, what happened to that other guy we sent to take the fort? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. What. The. F Nobody knew what was going on. The colonies were in open rebellion, and for now, they even seemed to be winning. So King George fired General Gage, replaced him with General William Howe, and ordered the rebellion to be put down immediately. Okay, the British are definitely going to retaliate for all of this, so we should probably put together a proper army. First, we need to pick a commander-in-chief, and I think we can all agree that that job should go to the man, the myth, the legend, George Washington. My friends, I am humbled and honored that you would consider me for such an important role. I did not expect for this All break. right, you've been showing up in a military uniform every day for the last 10 months. We all know you wanted this, so cut the crap, George. <laughs> Dude. Uncool. So Washington began his journey up to Boston to take command of the newly established Continental Army, just as the British made their first major attempt to break the siege. They made plans to take the high ground on Bunker Hill, but spies warned the Continentals of the British plans, so they fortified Bunker Hill and set up defensive positions on nearby Breed's Hill. The day of the battle came, and as the British advanced, a barrage of Continental gunfire was opened up on them. Twice they tried to climb the hill, twice they were pushed back. The battle lasted three hours until the Continentals finally ran out of ammunition and had to retreat, allowing the British to take the hill. While technically a British victory, they suffered nearly 1,000 casualties to the Continentals' 400. The colonists showed the British that this wasn't just a rebellion, it was war, and they were ready for it. But... Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, early battles of the war went to the British, but it really just came down to a lack of supplies and ammunition. On the American side, they didn't really have uh, a means of getting a lot of the, that stuff uh, early on in the war the way the British did. The British just had stockpiles of it. Um, so, and distributing it in the logistics of, of trying to put together an, an army or a militia that quickly is, is very, very difficult. But, um, yeah, a lot of the early battles, they went to the British for that reason and not so much because of the inability of the Americans to fight. Um, even though the British were generally more well trained, uh, the Americans had the advantage of knowing the territory, you know, the landscape, knowing you know, the, the weather. They just had the home field advantage basically on, in every way. They were just undermanned and undersupplied and undertrained. Uh, that would come to change later on, but in the very beginning, that was the biggest issue that they faced. Because it was all really pretty sudden, this whole thing. Uh, they didn't really plan rebellion until after the massacre. It was a very short amount of time before going from being loyal but dissenting to open rebellion, which are two very, very different stages of uh, stages of being. One thing they weren't sure about was why they were fighting. While some radicals were starting to throw around the I-word, most hoped to eventually repair their relationship with Great Britain. So they sent a letter to King George saying, Hey man, looks like things aren't going your way. Remove the taxes and let's be friends. I'm gonna kick your ass. Send that to the colonies. Your Majesty, your hand- Yeah, yeah. King George was probably the reason why the American Revolution happened. I mean, because not only was he imposing the taxes and forcing, you know, forcing down the heavy hand of Britain and everything, but the colonists, they tried to negotiate. They tried not to let it escalate like this, but King George was just this arrogant, arrogant man, and he, he really thought that it, it was... So he really thought that their rebellion against Britain was a rebellion against him personally. He took the rebellion personally. He thought it was an attack among, against himself, so he acted as though it were an attack against himself. Um, hence why he was so so hard on the colonists and why he, he advocated for open warfare to bring the, the colonies back into the fold instead of using negotiation, which the colonies were all for. Uh, independence wasn't really the goal at first. It was it was really just fair treatment. It was, you know, to keep King George's, um, King George's taxations, his repressions, all that stuff at bay, and, and hopefully, if all went well, the representation in the Parliament. Because, unlike a lot of other colonies at the time, um, or holdings by by the, the British, the 13 colonies were made up of entirely, you know, British citizens. They were, they were developed and they were 
much more advanced than a lot of other places. Um, so they felt that they should be sort of a special status within the Empire, and George disagreed, obviously, um, thinking that they were just they were just another possession, uh, another thing to have, and his actions really uh, sy symbolized that, and uh, the, he pretty much fueled the war early on. I mean, everything from the taxes forward was all him. The, the Americans never wanted it. Um, it. It didn't really come down to the point. It came down to the point where he was so incapable of being negotiated with that that's when the world independence are being thrown around that eventually get to the point where it's like we don't even want to be ruled by this guy anymore uh the way he's been treating us the way he's he's acting in his ineffective leadership we don't want to do it we think we can rule ourselves better than he can and so we're going to go ahead and try to do that we're going to break away and just run ourselves we have we have the we have the citizenry we have the infrastructure we can potentially have the trade with with other other countries such as france or spain we don't really need the british as much as they think with we do so that's when the independence were really starting to get thrown around is after king george antagonized them enough and that enough fighting had happened that they were like you know what forget it we don't even want to be part of the british empire anymore um yeah so a lot of it was just all all king george he was He's one of the many monarchs, um, I can point out, that was a very ineffective leader and who pretty much caused massive ripple effects throughout history just because of his ineffective leadership, his selfishness, and his arrogance. That's just what it came down to. Um, and being a monarch, he couldn't really be challenged, as, as, as the case with other, other monarchs who have made mistakes like this in the past. So... It's very interesting to, to see the development of events, but really interesting to see just how easily the, the revolution could have been averted, and it wasn't. Writing is terrible. Are you sure? Just do it. What does it say? He's gonna lick my... Gross. Oh my. So for the remainder of the year, oh small engagements continued to occur around the colonies. The British burned down the towns of Falmouth, Massachusetts, and Norfolk, Virginia as revenge for earlier anti-British incidents. These actions played right into the hands of Patriot propaganda. Overseas, the British were seen as brutes, and the French and Spanish would soon begin sending supplies to the rebel cause. During this time, there was also minor fighting going on between Patriot and Loyalist militias in the southern colonies. Benedict Arnold was still on a mission to win some personal glory for himself, so he headed up an attempt to invade Canada in a two-pronged attack. The Continentals managed to capture some British forts and the city of Montreal, but a harsh snowstorm with some smallpox on the side saw them defeated and pushed back at Quebec City, and they were forced to retreat all the way to Fort Ticonderoga. Speaking of which, remember all those guns and ammunition? Well, this guy's got a plan for what to do with them. He uses oxen to drag 120,000 pounds of artillery for two months through the harsh winter, 300 miles all the way to Washington and his Continental Army surrounding Boston. Boom. Washington's got himself some big guns. Which is fortunate, because up until now his army had been suffering through the cold winter, not knowing when the siege would end. Now, they could make a move. Washington wanted to launch a full assault on the city, but his junior officers felt the British were too fortified, and to his credit, Washington was great at hearing and taking on board the ideas of others. Instead, the Continentals worked through the night setting the guns up on Dorchester Heights overlooking the city, and when dawn broke and the British saw the guns, they knew they were toast. Their positions were completely exposed. It was checkmate. They had no choice but to abandon the city. 120 ships carried 9,000 redcoats and 2,000 loyalists away to an unknown fate, and Washington had his first victory of the war. Washington then moved his army to New York, knowing that when the British returned, they would probably land there. In the meantime, a friendly-looking old man by the name of Thomas Paine had written and published a pamphlet called Common Sense, in which he had advocated for total independence from Great Britain. It spread across the colonies like wildfire, and to this day remains the best-selling title in America. It was read aloud in taverns and meeting halls, and brought the idea of independence into the mainstream. Congress began to seriously consider the idea. Thomas Jefferson was selected to write up an official declaration of independence, and he went hard, writing that all men are created equal, with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, Jefferson had over 100 slaves, but we don't have to talk about that. On the 2nd of July, Congress voted unanimously in favor of independence, and John Adams declared that the 2nd of July would go down as the most remembered day 
day in American history. Then a couple days later, independence actually came into effect. The United States of America was born. There was no turning back now. The Americans tore down a statue of King George in New York and melted him down into 42,000 musket bowls. To the British, it was treason. And if the king had his way, Washington and all of Congress would be hung. Speaking of the British, guess who's back? The king sent an intimidating force of 130 warships and 25,000 men to New York. Washington knew that taking on the most powerful military in the world wouldn't be easy. The British set up camp on Staten Island as the Americans dug into defensive positions around Brooklyn Heights, waiting for an attack to come. But the British just waited, wearing down their opponent's nerve while building their own strength. At I think it's actually uh, notable to point out that um, the British were actually welcomed into Staten Island. Uh, a lot of the people there were still very pro-British. They didn't have to fight their way in, they just landed, unloaded, and the people were very welcoming of them. Um, and really throughout a lot of the war, uh, Staten Island, New York were, were pretty pro-British. It was one of the few places in the colonies that were still very pro-British. A lot of it had to do with the, the massive wealth of the area. There's a lot of very wealthy people um, who are not like plantation owners or anything like that but they were they were just wealthy families and um moguls and things of that nature so they were very welcoming of the british because they felt that it was better to be part of this sort of aristocracy of, of the british even if they lived within the colonies they still felt as though they were better than the common people and still felt that they were better than those that were rebelling and that rebellion was beneath them they 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 were snobs they were snobs and they thought that british culture was really the the answer and that it was the superior thing that than the the rabble of the americans um which actually considering that the revolution started in boston and that new york was so um welcoming of the British for a bunch of the war it actually that's supposed to be where the Boston New York rivalry comes from whether it be sports or other things you know the Red Sox Yankees and all that but that that's really actually where it stems from is that on one hand the Boston and Boston they were rebelling to the point that a massacre and the first battle of the war and in, in New York they're just letting the British in without any resistance and welcome them in, welcome them yeah, welcoming them into the in, onto the island so it, it's very interesting to, to point that out because uh when we think of the revolution we think of all the americans saying yeah independence let's go let's get away from britain but really there were a lot of loyalists in the war um there are a lot of american colonists that fought on the side of the british uh and many of whom fled to Canada once the war was over, but it was not a universal ideal by any any means. And even those who were not necessarily pro-British were also not pro-independence. They wanted to be part of the empire, but they disapproved of what the British were doing. They disapproved of the war and of the repressions and of the taxations, but they still wanted to be part of the empire. So there was a lot of people who were caught in the middle those who actually won independence and fought for independence were a relatively smaller group of people when compared to the number of people who could kind of go either way, who were who were in the middle there, who didn't approve of the British, but were also not willing to part with the empire, at least not yet. At one point, they launched a big scary artillery barrage and then said, you know, if I was you right now, I'd probably sue for peace. But Washington told them to shove it. The Americans kept holding out for what was coming, and when they finally hit, they hit hard. 15,000 British troops approached the American position, and the two sides fired on each other in massive rows. But what the Americans didn't realize was they were only fighting a decoy. The main British force was going around to flank the Americans from behind, and when they arrived, they inflicted heavy casualties. The Americans panicked and retreated back to Brooklyn Heights, where they then found themselves trapped between the British army and the river. It looked as though the war was already lost, but luckily, instead of attacking, the British decided to dig in for a siege, and then a thick fog set in, allowing Washington's army to escape across the river unimpeded. The British continued to chase and engage the Americans off Manhattan, and the Americans suffered defeat after defeat after defeat. It was a disaster. Washington's leadership was called into question, as thousands of American POWs were left to rot as traitors.
Washington's army fled through New Jersey all the way down to Pennsylvania. Rarely had an army been so badly beaten, yet survived to fight another day. Yeah, so that was part one. It's a very good uh, intro to what happened in the lead up to the war. Um, things, yeah, things did not go very well for the Americans at the beginning. There was a lot of people who, who started to question whether or not independence was even a the right move well the war was the right move um some wanted to sue for peace but they were caught in a weird position because of the one hand they wanted to sue for peace in the beginning they wanted to negotiate in the beginning and king george just simply wouldn't he would not <laughs> he would not negotiate um so they wanted to sue for peace but they knew that king george wasn't going to listen so it put him in a very awkward position um Yeah, so this was definitely an interesting video. Uh, I'll be doing part two very soon. So stay tuned for that one. I'm going to end the video here. If you have any other videos you'd like me to watch and check out, please put them in the comments section. If you like the video, please like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.